All right, um, we're moving into, well, they're all important concepts, but stratification really gets at the heart of um, multi-tiered societies, whether they're case societies or, um, or not. Uh, this is one of the, the, the essential ingredients of how we differentiate between others. Stratification, of course, refers to the systematic inequalities between groups of people that arise as intended or unintended consequences of social processes and relationships. Um, this is a characteristic of society that persists over generations. Um, <clears throat> and once it gets established, it's maintained through beliefs that are widely shared by the members of society. Um, in a stratified uh, society, groups at the top of the hierarchy have greater access to goods and services in society than members of groups at the bottom. So social stratification is meaningful. It, it represents what amount of share you get in um, the Earth's resources and um, the society's benefits and uh, and delinquencies so social stratification really is important one of the early voices in this debate about inequality comes from Jean-Jacques Rousseau um, in the 18th century and he argued that private property creates social inequality and that this inequality ultimately leads to social conflict. As you can imagine, this sounds kind of like Karl Marx. And we continue, we will continue to come back to the issue of private property and the implications that societies based on private property face. And, and of course, the idea that when you divvy out property based on uh, a, a system that is socially unequal, it's ultimately it's going to lead to conflict. Uh, Ferguson and Miller agreed with Rousseau, but they also argued that this is good because it means that some people are getting ahead and creating assets or a form of wealth that can be stored for the future. Um, these Scottish Enlightenment thinkers were just essentially uh, coming to the same conclusions that Rousseau were, uh, was in reference to inequality. The ability to create assets provides an incentive to work hard and be productive which in turn leads to higher degrees of social organization and efficiency, and ultimately to an improved society and civilization. At least that's how <clears throat> the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers were thinking about this. The irony, however, is that the ability to create and store surpluses is what creates inequality in the first place. Ah, uh, the old chicken and lay, uh, the old chicken and egg uh, paradox, which came first. The surplus or the inequality. Thomas Malthus also uh, chimed in on this subject. He viewed inequality favorably, but only as a means for controlling population growth. Remember, Malthus is talking about uh, the population bomb and, and ultimately what it will do to the Earth's resources. Um, he thought that a more equal distribution of resources would increase the world's population to an unsus unsustainable level and ultimately bring about mass starvation and conflict. So if we distribute resources fairly, people are going to do too well and it's going to stretch those resources thin and it's going to lead to um, great instabilities based on conflict. Once again, we come back to this idea of conflict. Systems of, of inequality are ultimately going to create conflict. It's just what they do.
Jörg Simmel, or uh, Jörg Simmel, Jörg uh, Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, um, Marx's teacher, he saw things as a master-slave dialectic. He believed that social relationships were based on this master-slave model, and over time, society would have more and more free people, and the master-slave model would ultimately die out. Uh, Simmel believed something uh, similar in, uh, in reference to that most social rela relationships in the world were based on a master-slave model in which the master becomes as dependent on the slave as the slave is on the on the master. He also believed that over time society would have more and more free people and the model would primary or the, would, the, the model would die out. Sorry, I think I said simul. I'm sorry, I was talking about uh, uh, Hegel. Um, well, has this model died out? We might not have a true master-slave relationship, but think about con consumption. Or examples of where, where people can who can afford to dine out every night become dependent on others to cook, and the cooks depend on the diners for continued salary. So this master-slave relationship does work its way out in consumption patterns um, in modern-day U.S. society. Um, when we're talking about standards of equality, well, what types of equality are we talking about? The ontological equality is the notion that everyone is created equal in the eyes of God. This model often justifies material inequality in this case. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor because God sees you as equal. Oh. Sucks to be you if you're poor. Or equality of opportunity. Inequality is acceptable so long as everyone has the opportunity for advancement and is judged by the same standards. This standard of equality is most closely associated with modern capitalist society and is a cornerstone of arguments made by civil rights activists in the United States in the 1960s. Um, the idea of equality of opportunity in the United States is one of its primary tenets, but um, as we've seen over time, it it was uh, it was merely an idea and not a reality. And the last thirty or forty years in the United States, we've been trying to uh, address that and, and to actually create a more fair equality of opportunity that allows more people to take advantage of the benefits of the system. Equality of condition is the idea that everyone should have an equal starting point from which to pursue his or her goals. Um, this standard of equality is most closely associated with modern cap capitalist society as well. And then you have equality of outcome, where everyone in a society should end up with the same rewards, regardless of the starting point, opportunities, or contributions. Uh, the standard of equality is most closely associated with communist ideology, and critics argue that without greater incentives to work and be productive, people would slack off and social process or social progress would be stymied. Um, some other forms of stratification, you have the estate system, which is a politically based system of stratification characterized by limited social mo uh, mobility. The estate system uh, is characterized by, as I said, limited social mobility that is best exemplified in the social organization of feudal Europe and the pre-Civil War American South. The case system, on the other hand, is a system of stratification based on hereditary notions of religious or theological purity and generally offers no prospects for social mobility. 
the Varna system in India is the most common example of a caste system today. And then, of course, the class system is an economically based system of stratification characterized by somewhat loose social mobility and categories based on roles in the production process rather than individual characteristics. So you're starting to see some of the choices that we have and how they play out in, in society and how they impact you over time and how they impact people in the world as well. Not every place looks like the United States and the United States isn't as good as all places. Uh, another important uh, social theorist uh, dealing with social stratification, of course, is Karl Marx. He felt that society was divided strictly into two classes, the proletariat or the working class and the bourgeoisie or the employing class. Um, another way to think about that is uh, those who own the means of production and those who, who, who do not. We've talked about Marx's conflict models and its implications on uh, capitalism and socialism over time and, and we'll continue to come back to Marx because once again he's another one of the biggies in the, in the discipline. Uh, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim are the three uh, towering figures in sociology that many of us draw our works off of and, and we continue to come back to. Eric Olin Wright also developed the concept of uh, contradictory class locations, which is the idea that people can occupy locations in the class structure that fall between the two pure classes defined by Marx. So um, there is class differentiation for Eric Olin Wright. It's just not as clear cut as the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat that Marx would have us believe. Uh, Max Weber, as well, dealt with the uh, concept of stratification. He felt it was based on grouping people according to the value of their property or labor in the commercial marketplace. It can be difficult to define class because the term means different things to different people and because people don't always fit in neatly into just one category. The status hierarchy system is a system of stratification based on social prestige. This prestige can be linked to different things such as occupation, lifestyle, or membership in certain organizations. But sociologists have most often studied occupational status. Um, and and that, you know, that really was, was Weber talking about it's more than just class, especially as our societies become more complex. Another form of stratification is the elite mass dichotomy. Um, C. Wright Mills was a pusher of this perspective, this, uh, where a system of stratification that has a governing elite, a few leaders who broadly hold the power of society. Vilfredo Pareto um, thought, uh, the, the great economist thought that the masses were better off in such a system because the most skilled and talented people would reach the governing elite. Um, C. Wright Mills, as I mentioned earlier, viewed this system as dangerous and detrimental as it consolidates power in the hands of the few who will act according to their interests as opposed to the interests of the masses. You might ask yourself, well, how is America stratified? Well, in the United States, the upper class is associated with income, wealth, power, and prestige but definitions related to specific levels of income or net worth can vary. It's not necessarily what they're worth, it's how much power they wield. There's little consensus about how to define the middle class, yet almost 90% of Americans self-define as being part of it. A further complication is how to separate the middle class from the working class. The middle class has historically been composed of white collar workers, but in the post-World War II economic boom, the working class essentially merged with the middle class. 
and gave manual laborers access to markers of middle class achievement, such as home ownership, 